Um, but so anyway, um, we can determine how a change in government purchases will affect our equilibrium. So uh, with the multiplier we talked about last week, we have um, the change in government purchases is um, will lead to a change in income by change of G over one minus the MPC. Um, we've used this money multiplier before. Um, so this will shift to the IS curve. Um, oh, well, actually, is kind of what our, our I already showed here. So we shift the IS curve to the right. So if the interest rate wasn't changing, if we were staying at R star, we would see that we would go to Y subscript 2, we'll call it. But because the government is increasing purchases, Y is increasing, there's some sort of crowding out effect that's occurring. And what actually happens is we don't see an increase um, as much as we thought we would have originally because now the interest rate has to go up to compensate for higher incomes, uh, more demand, and it'll bring us to a new equilibrium, which is Y prime, and a new um, interest rate, equilibrium interest rate, R prime. Does that make sense so far? This is just, I think this is like second week macroeconomics, but instead of supply and demand, it's investment savings, mm -hmm. um, liquidity market. Um, so when, we ha when G increases purchases, um, when G increases purchases, um, planned expenditure increases, which will increase the production of goods and services, which will also increase Y, which is what we show with this first change, right? But next we have to consider the liquidity preference. Demand for money dep uh, depends on income. So if we have an increase in income, um, then, and, but the quantity of money has not changed, then for every interest rate, there will be an increased demand of cash or for money. Um, but since there's no change in the money supply, we actually have to see a higher interest rate to compensate. Um, so what are firms going to do if the interest rate rises? What's the new word for more? So they're going to lower prices. Lower prices? Is that what you're saying? No. This has nothing to do with prices. Prices aren't going to change here. But so they'll invest more. Because interest rates are high? I was going to say, they might just save more. Yeah, they're not going to want to invest money because now it's going to cost them more to borrow. Um, so they actually reduce investment. Which is how we start talking about this crowding out effect. Like we see, all right, government purchases, we have this increase in income, but we also have an increase in R. If we have an increase in R, then interest rates go up. Well, that's what an increase in R is. But then businesses invest less. So the government crowds businesses out of the market. Um, but so, now we kind of drew the, see? Oh, no, no, this makes sense. I didn't put insert figure 12-1. But so, again, I, I showed this on the graph over there. With the change in government purchases, this is what we should have seen our income rise by. But we have that crowding out effect. Interest rates start going up, we have a liquidity preference, and we actually settle at Y2. Make sense? All right, change in taxes. So effects by change in taxes are similar to changes in government purchases, except the changes in consumption. So it's not going to be government, it's going to be consumption. Um, a decrease in taxes encourages individuals to spend more, which increases planned expenditure. So again, we have a similar analysis here. Um, but again, we're going to have the same issue where this increase, um, this will increase the interest rate and it will therefore suppress any potential to increase income. Um, we also saw from last week that the change, was it last week or maybe two weeks ago? Changes in taxes is, has less of an overall effect um, than changes in government spending. All 
Ah, okay. I'm just trying to keep up in the book. All right, so now we have monetary policy shifts. Uh, that's kind of what we're getting to in the LM curve. Um, one thing I want to make clear, and I know this is not clear to everybody because everybody is not here, but changes in fiscal policy are not changes to the money supply. Changes in monetary policy can lead to changes in the money supply. So if we talk about raising taxes, that does not have an effect on the money supply. That is very important. I saw that analysis a few times um, between the first and second homework assignment, and it's just something that you don't want to get caught in the habit of saying because it's not true. Um, taxes will not affect the money supply. What was that? Taxes will not affect the money supply. Right. Um, all right, but what, so going back to this, we're talking about uh, monetary policy shifts. So uh, we're gonna recall that a change in the money supply alters the interest rate that equilibrates um, the mo uh, money market for any given level of income. So we're gonna see a change in our LM curve. So if we see an increase in the money supply, uh, we're gonna see a shift to the right. And this makes sense, because now all of a sudden there is more money in the market, or in circulation. If there is more money circulating, then it's worth less. You're gonna pay less to borrow it, you're gonna pay less to invest. Um, and this just kinda makes sense. But so, when we have this increase in the money supply, um, holding our investment saving curve constant, we will see that income again rises, and our interest rate will fall. Um, so this really should stimulate investment in the goods market, which will increase plant expenditure, production, and income. So, it, which is different from a shift in the IS curve, because when our investment saving curve shift, we saw an increase, well, shift to the right, we saw an increase in income, but an increase and interest rates. Here we're seeing a decrease in interest rates and an increase in income. All right. This is going to be a very important concept, the monetary transmission mechanism. Um, neither of you took money in banking? Yes. But you will, hopefully. Maybe. You're a history, so you might not. You're not finance, so you might not. Uh, um, it is a good class. You do talk about the monetary transmission mechanism. So it will show that in the short run, an increase in the money supply also raises income, which is what we really just showed in this last graph. If we increase the money supply, we see an increase in income and a decrease in interest rates. So what the monetary transmission mechanism is, is an increase in the money supply should lower the interest rate, which simulates investment and thereby expanding the demand for goods and services. So expanding the money supply, or increasing the money supply, um, expand, uh, leads to economic growth, essentially. Um, in a small open economy, this is not something we really see in the United States so much, but in a small open economy, the exchange rate will also play a critical role here. Make sense so far? So now we have an interaction between monetary and fiscal policy. So um, we're going to see that there are three possible outcomes. So what we're going to see are these three things. So in A, the Fed is going to hold the money supply constant, um, reducing interest rates and income, but the re reduced interest rates stimulate the economy, reducing the effects of keeping the money supply constant. In B, the Fed holds the interest rate constant by reducing the money supply, deepening the recession. Oh, this is assuming we're in a recession. Um, and C, the Fed holds income constant by expanding the money supply. Uh, this shifts use of resources. An increase in taxes results in lower income, but the decrease in interest rates stimulates investment. Um, and then 
when analyzing one policy change, we must analyze how other policies can affect the change. This just kind of makes sense, right? So here, we have all these different things that happen. So um, a tax increase shifts the IS curve. So we go from investment saving curve one to investment saving curve two. Um, but the Fed did not change the money supply, so if they're not changing the money supply, interest rates fall and incomes will fall. Um, we can, you know, we get this just by basic, you know, kind of supply demand analysis that we've been used to doing. Um, here, we're going to see a tax increase shifts the IS curve again. So we go from IS1 to IS2. And the response is going to be, we want to hold interest rates constant. To hold interest rates constant, we must reduce the money supply. But that will lead to a much larger drop in income. And if you go back, you can, assuming these are the same situation, you can see that there is a much different change in income in this scenario when we keep the interest rate constant. All right. And then here, we want to keep income constant. So we have a tax increase, so that's going to shift our IS curve. This is the same thing that has happened in all previous scenarios. Our response is we're going to try to hold income constant. So to do that, we have to increase the money supply. By doing that, we stay at Y, prime, whatever it is. But now, instead of being at R1, we're now down here at R2. So we've greatly reduced the interest rate in this scenario. Um, so shocks to the investment savings curve are exogenous changes in the demand for goods and services resulting from individual animal spirit, self-fulfilling optimists and pessimism. That's a very long sentence with a lot of annoying words in it. Um, but so essentially all it means is this is a result of human beings doing what they want to do. Um, some people choose to save for the future because they think the future is meek and miserable. Some people say, no, the future is going to be great. I'm going to spend money. When everyone thinks the future is going to be great and they're going to spend money, that means our investment savings curve shifts to the left, reduces. We're not saving. Um, but if everyone's savings, then we have a lower interest rate because everyone's saving. There's a lot of money to be loaned out, but no one really wants it. Well, businesses will. You following? Yeah. I was just going like, to think of the graphs less. That's good. You should think of the graphs. The graphs make everything a lot easier, believe it or not. So if a firm is not optimistic about the future, they will not build many factories. That makes sense. If Apple thinks the sale of, uh, of iPhones is going to go down dramatically and Google is going to take over, they're not going to go build a bunch of factories. Why would they spend that money if they don't think they're going to be profitable in the long run? Um, but this will result in less investment, reducing future employment, reducing PE, uh, planned expenditure, causing a reduction in income and employment. So this is that self-fulfilling part of that sentence. So if people think the future are, is going to be bad, they're going to plan for the future to be bad, and it will make the future bad, bad really. Um, Shocks, so again, this is in the section about sh shocks. Um, it may also be caused by changes in demand for consumer goods. So if a popular president wins the election, they may increase consumer confidence, um, reducing savings for the future, and increasing savings for today. Um, and then we have shocks to the LM curve. They arise from exogenous changes in the demand for money. So we suppose a new regulation reduces the availability of credit cards. Um, this will increase the amount of cash that people choose to hold, and it'll increase the interest rate. Because now we need cash to buy things. We can't just put everything on credit. Does that kind of make sense? So is it better for, it's going to sound really stupid, I think, but is it better for like people, like, you want people to be optimistic for things? But like, 
We want people to be tempered. Yeah. We don't want them to be wholeheartedly optimistic. But at the same time, we don't want people to be entirely pessimistic. Yeah, yeah. You always need a balance. Mm -hmm. Too much of a good thing isn't always good. So, So like, after um, recently, you're like, oh, recession's coming, recession's coming. So why is like all the markets still kind of flourishing? Like, some people are pessimistic about like the future. Um, so just wait, I'm sorry. Well, it really, there's a lot more to it than just that. I mean, not everyone overwhelmingly is pessimistic about the future. And a lot of people also like to ride the high, essentially. If the people are thinking, oh, things are good, they're going to stay good. They're going to continue to make investments, which may keep things good. Um, but then the other thing that you have to be concerned about is maybe the bottom will just fall out. Um, so there's always a recession coming. I mean, that's, that's just the nature of it. There's always one coming. We don't know when exactly it's going to come. Uh, we usually have some sort of idea when it might hit. We see signs, you know, like, oh, we see reduced number of hours worked. We see manufacturing reducing. Um, and we can see conflicting information, you know, like sometimes we'll see hours worked increase but investments down. So there's a lot that goes into analysis. So I can't say exactly why we haven't hit a recession, but if people are warning that a recession may hit, then there's probably some sort of indicator saying a recession is on its way. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. So, this is our equilibrium. All right. Now, we have new regulations reducing the availability of credit, increasing the amount of cash that individuals choose to hold, um, which will increase our interest rate. So, now they're not saving. IS changes, but our money supply has not changed. We didn't say anything about changing the money supply. So now we have increased our interest rate. We may also see why. There could always be a response saying, no, we have to decrease the money supply or whatever it is. But for now, we see an increase in interest rate. This is a dog I was dog sitting. Last year, when I did this chapter, I was dog sitting these dogs. So I included pictures of them. I didn't take them out because I think they're great pictures. All right. All right, so Fed policy. What's the Fed policy instrument? The money supply or the interest rate? So this is important. So more recently, the Fed has used the federal funds rate for short run policy. Um, That's just something that you should know. Uh, The FOMC meets every six weeks to determine the interest rate until the uh, next meeting, followed by the Fed's bond traders, conducting the necessary open market operations to set the interest rate, affecting the money supply. So, they all go to this meeting, and they say, we want our interest rate to be one and a quarter percent. If interest rates are at four percent, or even one and a half percent. That means they have to start selling bonds. Wait, I always get this backwards. Yes. No. They have to start buying bonds. Because bonds work opposite to how everyone wants them to. Bonds for the last team, I think, really got them. Not got them, but like, I once came in here and talked about bonds for like an hour. Um, So bonds work in a way where you pay more for them and the interest rate lowers. That's just how it is. Um, Are you 
both familiar with the bond market at all? Not really. No? Ish. That doesn't count. Yeah. All right. We're taking a detour. All right. So this is a bond. It is worth $1,000. I'm going to sell the bond to you for $950. So you give me $950, I give you a bond that's worth $1,000. I've just taken money out of the uh, money supply if I am, you know, the Fed. So now we decide we need to increase the interest rate. But there are, I don't know, 10, I'm not gonna go to 10 of these. So by selling it for $50 cheaper, you take money out. What? By selling it for $50 cheaper, you take money out of the supply. Uh, no, that's not what I'm getting at. Okay. Bonds just always work where you sell them for less than what they're worth. Well, I mean, there was like rare cases in Germany, like four years ago, where people were paying more than what the bond was worth. But that was like really tricky. All right, so 950, 950, 950, 950, nine. All right, so we have these six bonds out in circulation, whatever it is. We decide we want to increase we want to increase or do we want to lower the money supply? What, what do we want to do first? Increase the money supply. All right, we want to increase the money supply. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to go on the market. Right now we have, what is this? One, two, three, four, five. We have oh, six. We have six of these bonds that, we, that someone's holding. We're going to say, hey, I'm going to buy that bond from you. I will give you $1,000. But now there's only five bonds. So now, People are saying, wait, these are good bonds. We want these bonds. So now, instead of them being sold for 950, maybe they're worth 978. So we have increased the money supply because we took a bond out of the market and we gave someone cash. Now all of these other bonds are worth more. So the interest rate, the effective interest rate on them is less. Does that make sense? Whatsoever. Yes. So there were six bonds. We decide we need to increase the interest rate. Originally, all the bonds were worth 950. And I don't know what that is. What is that, 2%? $50 divided by $1,000. I think it's 0 0.02. So it's 2%. That's what everyone was earning on these bonds, 2%. We said, we're gonna take one of the bonds out. We're gonna give you $1,000. We're buying, it's gone. Now all of the other bonds, we reduced the supply of bonds. They all have, now they're all worth more money. The bond itself is worth more money. So now it's worth $978. So each of these is worth $978. But now, instead of you getting 2%, you get 22 divided by 1,000 equals, I don't know, what's that equal? Probably 0.01. Oh, wait, this was I was just thinking, isn't that, yeah, I'm sorry. No. Now here, we get 2.2%. So we have increased the money supply. We gave someone cash in exchange for a bond. We've increased the price of all these other bonds that are still out there. And now the interest rate has gone from 5% to 2.2%. Make sense? Better now with this? All right. So, when bond traders are told to increase the interest rate, they sell bonds and that will reduce the money supply. So now we'll do the same scenario, but backwards. So I'm gonna get rid of most of these. And by most of it, I mean the numbers. Hello. What time is it? Oh, all right, we're doing good. All right, so now we're back 
to this original scenario. Now the bond traders are told we need to produce some money supply. So here's what we're going to do: we're going to take a bond and we are going to sell it to the public. So we sell the bond to the public, thousand dollar bond. But now there's a seventh bond in the market, so now they're not worth nine fifty; they're going to be worth nine oh eight. So we're changing all of these numbers to nine oh eight. I know, how fun! I just wrote them all, and now we're getting rid of them. The more there are in the market, the less they're worth. The, you know, the, the lesser, less bonds in the market, the more they're worth. Yes. Okay. So now we've increased the number of bonds in the market. And by doing that, we've now taken an additional $908 out of the money supply. Mm -hmm. Because now the Fed has that money. They're the ones holding it. So we went from a 5% interest rate. That's where we were at before. And now uh, we're at a 9.2% interest rate. Granted, the changes would not be this dramatic whatsoever. This is a market where there's only seven bonds in circulation. We're talking about maybe, I don't know, an $8,000 money supply. The United States is much more complicated than that. But that's the idea. So as you increase the number of bonds, you reduce the money supply, because now you gave the Fed money. If you're the public, you give the Fed money, they hold on to it, you get a bond. Now that money cannot circulate. Does that make sense? So more bonds, more money supply. So you said the more, more bonds, bonds, less money supply. Okay. All right. I might not actually have that many more slides to go. How's that one? We're on 15. How many do we have? There is, but there's a jumbled dot. Yeah, mostly slides too. All right. So, um, aggregate demand describes the relationship between the price level and the le level of national income. So, our analysis also shows that for a higher given price level, there was a lower level of income. This is all from last week. Um, so, an increase in the money supply shifts aggregate demand to the right, and a decrease shifts aggregate demand to the left. So now we have LM, which is dependent on price. So first, we're going to derive the aggregate demand curve by using the ISLM model. Ah, that's what we have here. All right, so first, we have a higher price level, P, and it shifts the LM curve upwards. So we were at Y1 and P1, Y1, P1, and now we're at Y2, P2, Y2, P2. And that is how we get the aggregate demand curve. Does that make sense? Yeah. So as prices rise, we demand less because we also have less money. This was the thing I started last week. Someone asked a question. I was like, well, we just get the aggregate demand curve by doing this. And then I was like, wait a minute, no, we'll just talk about it next week. Yeah. Um, all right, so the thing that causes the ISOLM curve to shift to the given price level also shifts the aggregate demand curve. We just showed that, we just talked about that. So an increase in government purchases or a decrease in taxes shifts the LM curve. So therefore it also shifts the aggregate demand curve to the right. We'll see the same shift. Um, an, in oh, I said that one. Um, an increase in taxes, a decrease in government purchases, or a decrease in the money supply um, will shift to the left. Uh, a change in income in the ISLM model resulting from a change in, in the price level represents a movement along the aggregate demand curve. So we've talked about movements of our shifts before. Um, and a change in income in the ISLM model for a given price level represents a shift in aggregate demand curve. 
there's a lot of facts about how we move along the aggregate demand curve given the ISL impact. All right, so we see an increase in taxes. Oh, well, we have this, you know, P1, uh, no, it isn't P1, P1, Y1, right? So that's right here, that's, well, kind of, close enough. Um, so now we see an increase in taxes. So now our investment savings curve, we'll shift to the left, But now, we're also gonna, so we have our aggregate demand curve. I had to do one thing, I had to get that line to go through the circle and I couldn't do it. All right. That is our aggregate demand curve. Now, we can shift our IS curve because we've increased taxes. Again, we're gonna shift the aggregate demand curve. First thing we have, we have an expansionary shift, uh, a monetary, monetary expansion, expansion shifts the LM curve. So we've changed our interest rate. We have lowered our interest rate. Our income has increased. So now, since there is an income increase, more is demanded at every price level. If we have more money, um, we're going to demand more given the price level. Um, so that's expansionary monetary policy. There's more money in the system. We'll pay more for the same good, essentially. Or we'll buy more goods at the same price. That's really what it means. Uh, um, we also have an expansionary fiscal policy. So uh, a fiscal expansion shifts the IS curve to the right. And therefore, aggregate demand will also shift to the right. Um, the government's purchasing more goods. So we said already, incomes will increase. Um, so we've watched that happen here. And now we kept our price the same. That's the analysis we're doing here. And if we're keeping the price the same, but incomes increase, we're gonna purchase more of something. It's like all of a sudden, let's say you were making $1,000 a month and you buy pizza once a month. Now. You're making $7,000 a month. Maybe you buy pizza five or six times a month. Price hasn't changed, income has. Oh, that's Zizo. That's Koiki's buddy. He's uh, 13 and a half, I think, now. His birthday is May, so he's almost 14. Or he's, almost, he's either almost 13 or almost 14, but his birthday is May 19. Um, all right, so ISLM has a theory of aggregate demand, um, the ISLM model in the short run and the long run. Ah, these beautiful graphs have come back, which is what confused everyone two chapters ago. All right, so now that we've seen how a change in the price affects the equilibrium in the ISLM model, we can now use the model to describe the economy in the long run. So to do this analysis, we need three things, the IS curve, the LM curve, and the vertical line representing the nat natural level of output. See figure 12-7, figure 12-7.
So from the two diagrams, we can see that the short run equilibrium and how it will move along the curves to reach the long run equilibrium. Um, so in the Keynesian model, the price level is stuck at point K, but in the classical model, the price level is fully flexible. So we have the ISLM model, so we have the long run aggregate supply. So Keynes says we're going to stay at this price level. The classicalists say, no, the price level is going to fall. We're going to go back to here. Um, where really we're stuck there, according to Keynes. Uh, this is long run. Well, ISLM long run. But then we also have that, the model of aggregate supply and aggregate demand. So this is the model that we've seen more, not more, because we usually have upward slanting aggregate supply. But so we have price level one, price level two, long run aggregate supply, and aggregate demand. So Keynes again says we're stuck at K, and in the long run, what we'll get back to is we'll, we'll reduce incomes, but then we'll move along this aggregate demand curve as prices decrease, and we'll get down to price level two, and we will be at equilibrium once again, where the long run aggregate supply uh, line, aggregate demand, and the short run aggregate supply all are in unison at that one spot. Um, what we've, I say we've, but what I've heard said many times is that Keynes describes the short run, classicalists describe the long run. Because um, again, classicalists, classicalists all talk about the price level changing. We don't really have the price level change in the short run. Only in the long run can it change. All right. So we have the IS equation, which is Y equals C, which is a function of income and taxes, plus investment, which is dependent on R, plus government spending, describes the equilibrium in the goods and services market, the goods market and services, really. Um, the LM curve, which is money supply over price level equals um, L, liquidity, which is dependent on the interest rate and income, describes the money markets. Y, P, and R are all endogenous. So endogenous means what? Determined where inside. Yeah, inside the market. Um, the Keynesian third equation is P equals P1 meaning that prices are constant and the R and Y must adjust. Where the classicalist third equation is Y equals Y bar, meaning income stays the same. Um, and again, the classical model is better suited for the long run. All right. Question. So table 12.1 is going to be in this graph, in this PowerPoint, but so it will show that the decline in income coincided with the fall in interest rate uh, caused by contradictory shifts in the IS curve. So the stock market crash and the wariness about the future may have reduced spending and savings for the future, lowering the interest rate. All right. Um, another hypothesis hypothesis is that a reduction in housing investment caused by either overinvestment in the 1920s or a reduction in the amount of immigrants uh, reducing the need for new housing. So what caused the Great Depression, really? That's the question. Um, bank closures could have also been made it difficult for firms to get loans to make the correct capital investment. So why was it so bad? Well, banks could, companies couldn't get money. And the government was also more concerned about a balanced budget than simulating the economy. Um, there was a time in our nation's history where we had a balanced budget. We haven't had one in a long time. Um, but that was their concern. They wanted to make sure that they weren't borrowing money. So they wanted no debt. Yes. 
or they didn't want to add to the debt, is really what it comes down to. Oh, another dog. Well, it's the same dog, but at a different point. Alright. Um, so we can watch how the unemployment rate changed dramatically. Um, we went from 3.2% in 1929, which is incredibly low, up to 25.2% in 1933. That is a big change in four years. Um, we watch real GMP reduced, consumption goes down. Again, we're going to notice consumption does not change as much as investment. We talked about this a few times, and it's because people still have to buy things. They still need to buy food. Um, government purchases also reduced slightly. Um, nominal interest rates went down to almost zero, almost zero. The Fed actually reduced, not the, yeah, the Fed. Did the, the Fed yeah, the Fed existed at this time. Um, they reduced the money supply, price level fell. We had deflation, negative inflation, deflation. Um, and real money balances decreased up until 1932, and then they started to increase. Oh, no, they increased some in there, too. Um, this chart tells a lot about the Depression. Notice, you know, we it takes us five years to get down to $141 billion. That's what it was at the time, billion. And then another five years to get just back to where we were 10 years before. Um, so others blame the play, uh, place the blame. Yeah, place the blame on the Fed for allowing the money supply to reduce so much. Um, again, I mentioned that they reduced the money supply twenty five percent. And trying to use the ISLM curve to explain this is difficult because real money balances rose, meaning policy, monetary policy should have been expansionary. Um, and if a contradictory shift in LM had occurred, uh, we would have expected higher interest rates, but that's not what we saw. We saw lower interest rates. This next one might be a dog again. Um, we talked about the price level. The price level fell 22% within those four years. And we had the stabilizing effects of deflation. So falling prices raises income for any given supply of money. And then we have the Peugeot effect. I don't think I spelled that right. I think there's a T at the end. No, no T. Um, falling prices, oh wait, Peugeot effect. As real money balances fall, households feel wealthier and they spend more money making economists believe that the falling prices would actually stabilize the economy. That didn't happen. Um, but that's kind of what households do, and then economists are like, no, everything's going to be fine. It's not. Spoiler alert. We all know what, how the Great Depression ends. It actually does end, but as a result of other things. Uh, and then we have the destabilizing effects of deflation. So we have debt deflation, so it describes the effects of unexpected falls in the price level, um, unexpected change in the price level shifts wealth from debtors to creditors. We talked about this with inflation. So if money is now worth less than it was worth when you borrowed money, when you borrowed money originally, you're now paying back a lot more than you originally borrowed. Because if you borrow $10, and you pay back $20 in 10 years, but the interest rate goes along with it, then let's say we have 10% inflation each year. We're not going to use compound because then it's really different. I don't feel like doing that much math right now. Or if you have $10 and you already have agreed that you're paying back $20, but now we have negative 
ten percent um, inflation. Now, in ten years, each dollar is worth like, or you're going to wind up paying back in this year's terms is going to wind up being like I don't know. I could do this math. Can I? I don't know, let's call it $100. So you wind up paying back a lot more um, with deflation. Um, this affects spending on goods and services. As long as creditors and debtors, debtors have the same propensity to set, spend, but our theory says they don't because debtors have an increased propensity to spend and creditors have a lower propensity to spend. Um, and to see how unexpected decreases in price affect the economy, we must add the real interest rate to our model. Um, if people expect inflation to fall, then real interest rates are higher, all right, reducing investment even further down than zero inflation because firms believe they'll have to pay back higher amounts. All right. So if people are expecting deflation, they're not going to borrow money because they don't want to pay back more. If anything, they would want to borrow money hoping that the interest rates are going to rise because then they're paying back money or inflation is going to rise, then they're paying back money that is now worth significantly less than expected. Um, remember, we called this ex post anti inflation. It's after the fact we've realized it. We know what the inflation is. We hope inflation will pay off part of the debt. What? We hope that inflation will pay off part of the debt. Yeah, exactly. All right. We have LM, doesn't change, investment saving, and we have a shift in our investment savings curve. And this is our expected inflation here. That shows this shift we get us down from interest rate one down to interest rate two. But remember, R is real interest rate. I includes inflation, right? So um, an expected deflation, a negative value of expected inflation. Um, raises the real interest rate for any given nominal interest rate. That's not good. You don't want that. And this depresses investment spending. Um, the reduction in investment shifts the IS curve downward. Um, the level of income falls from Y1 to Y2. And the nominal interest rate falls from I1 to I2. And the real interest rate rises from R1 to R2. So we see an increase in the real interest rate, a decrease in the nominal interest rate, we see deflation causing investments to decrease, causing incomes to decrease. Could it happen again? Um, possibly. Um, that's essentially what we got to here. We've done a lot of things. We they've done a lot of studies on it. Um, they hope they figure a lot of it out, uh, but they can't entirely agree as to what caused it. And because of that, it is impossible to say it will never happen. Um, but they don't think it'll happen again because they've done so much research and they've done so much investigating. Um, in the 1990s, uh, oh, the liquidity trap, the zero lower bound. All right, this has been a concern also up until like this year. Um, so I tried explaining this to one of my brothers. So. I guess it was the beginning of this year, he said, if the economy is doing good, why would they increase the interest rate? And I said, well, they have to increase the interest rate because the economy is doing good. He goes, well, why don't they just let it ride, keep the interest rate low? And I said, well, that could be a problem because if they don't increase the interest rate when the economy is good, then eventually when the economy is not good, they can't do anything to help because they can't lower the interest rate. Um, that's what kind of happened with the recession that we had and here with the depression. When the interest rate is so low, you can't cut the interest rate even more. You can't entice businesses to invest money with a lower interest rate because you can't go below zero. So 
eventually you get to this point where monetary policy can no longer be used to affect the economy. Uh, if rates are negative, individuals would just hold cash because then the money will just be worth more. Um, other, other economists believe that the Fed has other tools such as lowering long-term interest rates, um, which is an option. Uh, another option is to devalue the currency, which will make domestic goods cheaper relative to foreign goods, and it will increase the demand of a brand. Um, so that's essentially us just printing money, really. Um, and lastly, the Fed can have a high target interest rate, giving them more wiggle room if the economy needs a bump. Does that work in 2008 terms? Just printing money? What? Just printing money? I don't know how much they just printed. I mean, they had the, um, what they called the stimulus package, where they sent money to a bunch of people, but actually what they found they were doing with the money is they were using it to pay down debt. Um, they weren't using it to pot, buy goods as it was originally planned. Um, they had credit card debt. I think it was like each family got like $400 or something. They would take the $400 and they wouldn't go out to dinner because the recession was an issue around debt a lot of the time. Um, for many individuals, they over borrowed, so they took the mo whatever money they got and just paid their creditors, which didn't help all that much. Um, these are the two dogs together. Please don't boogie. And that might be it. That is it. Um, I feel like I went through that chapter very quickly. Um, I guess in about an hour. So that makes sense. Um, so my original plan was that I am canceling next week, um, not for any particular reason, except I did last year. And what I do instead is, where's my account this whole thing? I have these assignments. Questions for chapter 11 and 12. Um, so there are four questions. Um, what you all would have to do is pick a time to meet together and work on it together. I don't need six copies, but the idea is you all have to work together. That is the important. You can you know, work on them and then bring your answers together and negotiate and see how you feel, but you need to work together. That is the biggest part of this. Um, so I will send an email. Um, what's nice about doing it this way is you're not required to be here at, on Thursday at 4.20 or 4.05. You could, Maybe you'll be like, hey, let's meet Monday at 10 o'clock at night for whatever reason. I don't care. But you all have to be there. I want photo proof. I guess. I don't know. Um, but that's kind of it. And like I said, I'll send an email. But. Thank you.